And the background? Uh, only uh, lower your, your microphone completely. Microphone. Uh, that's already your sound on the computer. Oh, that's it's normal. We will put it back when you talk. Just on your time. Okay. Okay, well, I will add uh, okay. Okay. Hello, can you hear me, May? Yes, I can. <laughs> Excellent. So we're all set, I think. You are ready? Yes. Yes. Okay, very good. So, um, dames and heren, ladies and gentlemen, yacht collegas, dear colleagues, I hereby formally open this session and I welcome you all to the public defense of Mrs. Maygate Pedersen. Mrs. Maygate Pedersen has presented to the faculty her PhD thesis on the topic interior rotation, mixing and ages of a sample of slowly pulsating B stars from gra gravity mode asterosismology in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of PhD in science, astronomy and astrophysics. She shall now publicly defend her PhD thesis. Mrs. Megat Pedersen, you are invited to give a presentation of about 45 minutes about your work. Afterwards, the examination committee will ask questions and discuss your work with you. I now give the floor to uh, Mrs. Megat Pedersen. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here for my public defense, PhD defense. So now the good thing about having it online uh, is that a lot more people are able to join. So I know a lot of my family and friends from Denmark are tuning in. Thank you for being here and following. So basically today I'll be talking about what I've been doing for my PhD studies. I'll be talking about pulsating stars and astro seismology. But first of all, I will like to start and take everyone back to the earth and talk about earthquakes. So when an earthquake happens, it generates ripples, waves that propagate throughout the earth. As these waves reach different regions of different composition, densities and phases, such as regions of solid or molten rock, the speed of the waves will change and the waves start to bend. As a result, the waves will arrive at different times at the surface of the earth. Now a way to try and follow these ways is by drawing propagation diagrams, which is basically you take and draw a line behind the front of the wave and through this illustrate how the waves travel throughout the earth. An example of such a diagram is shown here, where each one of the lines corresponds to the travel path of the wave. As the wave reaches different regions, the waves will bend, resulting in the waves arriving at different positions than otherwise expected at the surface. And you also end up with regions where the waves do not reach the surface of the Earth at all. By now placing seismometers at the surface of the Earth at different positions, we can measure the arrival times of the waves and their properties. And based on this, seismologists use these measurements to constrain the interior structure of the Earth. So now today we know that the Earth consists of a solid inner core, a liquid outer core, and a stiffer mantle. So in the analogy, if you look at planets, the study of waves and earthquakes are referred, is referred to as seismology. Similarly, astronomers can study waves inside of stars to constrain their interiors. And these studies is referred to as astroseismology. With this next illustration, animation, I'm showing you what this, these kind of waves looks like using a 3D animation of a star that's much more massive than the sun. The different colors corresponds to different fluctuations in the temperature. And you see here the generation and propagation of the waves inside the star. In the core of the star, the star has a convective core meaning that the energy generated in the core of the star is transported away by convection, where hotter blobs of gas rise upwards, dissolve, transport 
the energy while cooler blobs of gas will sink towards the center. This turbulent motion that's generated by the waves, by the convective blocks in this case, generates the waves that you see propagating in the envelope of the star. And as these waves reach the surface, they lead to temperature fluctuations, thereby differences in the brightness at the surface, which we can use as astronomers to study the interior properties of the stars. Now, the way that stars generate energy in their course is through nuclear burning, nuclear fusion, where 90% of their life they spend burning hydrogen to helium in their course, and in this process, releasing energy. Now, the sun right now consists of about 74% hydrogen, 25% helium, and the rest of the elements we group together and call metals. We also use letters X, Y, and Z to represent these fractions, which are basically the fraction of the total mass of the star that consists of hydrogen, helium, and metals. And combined, this adds up to one. Now, what mixing does in stars is to allow from new hydrogen fuel to be transported towards the core of the star, meaning that the stars will be able to live longer than otherwise predicted. So my PhD work focuses on trying to study these interior mixing properties of stars using astro seismology. Now to take a few steps back, first of all, I'd like to introduce how astronomers usually group stars. So stars put group stars into their classifications according to temperature, where you see here seven different stellar classes temperature classes where we go from the smaller cooler stars towards larger brighter and hotter stars now the sun has a spectral type of g in this diagram it has a mass of one solar mass so that's just how astronomers measure the mass of stars in general however as we go towards the left in this diagram you see that we have both o and b type stars which are much more massive than the sun and also a lot hotter than the sun. These stars we refer to as high mass stars and also nickname them as the chemical factories of the universe. They get this nickname because they're responsible for the production of the heaviest elements in the universe, both throughout their life and later in their death, which they feed back to their environment and allow changing the composition of their environment and new forming stars as well as planetary systems. Now, aside from temperatures, astronomers also use the luminosity of the star to group them, so that in combined, we put them in what we call a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So that's a diagram you see here on the left, where you have temperature increasing towards the left, you have the spectral classes, the stellar type, and you have luminosity increasing upwards in this diagram. Now, if we take all the stars in our galaxies and put them in this diagram, you see that you end up with different groupings of the stars, where the vast majority finds and falls on this diagonal line, which we call the main sequence. So this is where the stars are located when they burn hydrogen to helium in their course. Now to accurately put the stars in this diagram, you need to know the distance to the star. So let's assume we have two stars that are exactly identical. If one of them is moved further away than the other, it will appear to be fainter than the closest star, even though they are of exactly the same kind. So we need the distances to actually make the correction, get accurate luminosities, and place them in this type of diagram. Now, my, the focus on this presentation is on the O and B type stars. So the stars on the upper end of this diagram, on the main sequence. And these stars share the same kind of chemical interior structure. So using again the 3D simulation as before, first of all, we group the star into three different regions. You have the convective core in the center. You have a radiative envelope where the energy is transported away by radiation. And between the two, you have a transition region. Now these kind of stars burn hydrogen to helium through the CNO cycle predominant, predominantly. So basically the end product is the same. You get four hydrogen atom, four hydrogen nucleus that are transformed into helium. But in doing so, this process uses, 
uses isotopes of C, N, and O. So these reaction cycle, as you look at here, the reaction takes place at the stars that you see. Arrows points towards nucleus that goes into the action, and arrows outwards are the products of the reaction. Now, out of this entire cycle, there's one reaction that is particularly slow, according compared to the rest, and that is the reaction where a nitrogen, nitrogen 14 isotope interacts with a hydrogen nucleus. Because of this reaction being much slower than the rest, effectively what happens is that you get a buildup of nitrogen in the core of the star. And now if you have extra element mixing taking place inside the star, basically you can end up transporting excess nitrogen from the core to the surface, thereby changing the nitrogen abundance to different values that you would expect. And at the same time, you get hydrogen transported towards the core of the star. Now, if we have a look at how these stars evolve in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that I mentioned earlier, you see here on your left, the evolutionary track of a B-type star, basically, evolving from the left, lower left corner to the upper right. On the right, you see what the hydrogen mass fraction profile looks like when you go from the center towards the surface of the star at about 35% here of the total mass of the star. At the 08's main sequence, which is the point where the stars first enter the main sequence, we expect to see a flat hydrogen mass fraction profile as the star evolves. You burn hydrogen to helium, so the amount of hydrogen in the core decreases and reaches about half of the content when we are halfway through the main sequence evolution. And at the very end, we get rid of all the hydrogen in the core, basically. Now, the reason why this curves are flat in the bottom is caused by the convection. So convection in the core occurs very fast and the mixing induced by it is very efficient. And effectively, the chemical composition inside the star in this region is homogeneous. So basically, what we can use also these diagrams to see is that the very end, where you no longer have a homogeneous part of this profile, is basically indicating the size of the core. And what we are seeing here is as we go from the C8 main sequence to the end of the main sequence, the convective core shrinks. Okay. So going back to this interior structure diagram I was showing before, let's have a look at the interior mixing properties of the stars. So on the right, you see here a mixing diagram showing you on the y-axis the efficiency of the mixing as we go from the center towards the surface of the star. Now, just like we grouped the star into three different regions before, we group this mixing profile into three different regions where we have the convective core with a high efficiency of mixing. We have convective boundary mixing at, in the transition layer. And then finally, we have the envelope mixing as well. So to have a look at what these mixing profiles, how they change the evolution of the star, we can first of all have a look at how this convective boundary mixing changes the main sequence evolution of the star, as shown here in the next slide. So again, you have on the left, you have our mixing diagram. In the center, you have evolutionary tracks in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And finally, on the right, we have our hydrogen mass fraction profiles going from the center towards the surface of the star. Now, in the absence of mixing, absence of mixing these profiles follow the white lines that you see in these diagrams. And if we start increasing the size of this convective boundary mixing region, these curves transitions from the white towards the darker blue. So basically what happens is that the effective size of the core of the star becomes larger when you have larger convective boundary mixing regions. As a result, we have more fuel available for nuclear burning, meaning that the stars end up living longer on the main sequence and the evolutionary tracks shifts upwards towards the right. And finally, you end up with larger helium core masses after the main sequence evolution. If we go back 
and have a look at also the surface nitrogen abundances, then one mechanism that could lead to high amount of mixing in the envelope of the star, which is needed to transport the nitrogen excess from the center towards the surface, is rotation. So basically, to illustrate this, I'm showing you here a hunter diagram where what is plotted is for each of these dots corresponds to a star. On the y-axis, you have the nitrogen abundance. And on the x-axis, you have this surface rotation rate of the star. Now, the color background shows you where theory would predict most of these stars to follow, going from lighter in color to where you have almost no stars to the majority of the stars following these darker regions. So basically, what you would expect if rotation is the cause of the surface nitrogen excess that is observed for some of these stars, you would expect as the rotation rate of the star increases, the amount of envelope mixing also increases. And therefore, you would expect the surface nitrogen abundance to increase as well, following this black dashed line. However, what we also see in this diagram is that at low rotation rates, you have a group of stars that also show this surface nitrogen excess. So basically what this diagram is telling you is that rotation alone cannot be the only mechanism leading to this enhanced surface nitrogen abundance. Now mixing profiles inside of stars can take on various different shapes. And here I'm showing you just three of them. Where once again, we have divided into three regions, what the mixing profile looks like. On the left, you have assuming a constant level of mixing inside the convective boundary mixing region. In the center, we are assuming that the mixing decreases as we go further away from the star. And on the right, it's showing you differences between two envelope mixing profiles, one where we assume that the mixing in the envelope is constant, and the other assuming that the mixing increases as we move towards the surface of the star which is what you'd expect to see in the case of internal gravity waves. Now, our problem is that we actually don't know what the real mixing profile of stars look like. So what we want to do is to try and use astroseismic modeling to try and constrain these interior mixing profiles. So let's once again have a look at the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And now we put two stars into this diagram. If we include the pulsation information that we have, we end up with the astroseismic HR diagram. So basically what this is showing you is that these different regions correspond to different types of pulsators. And if your star ends up falling inside any of these different regions during its evolution, we expect it to start to pulsate. For the O and B type stars, we expect to see two kinds of oscillations. One is from the gravity modes, which have gravity as a restoring force, and the other is from pressure modes, which has pressure as a restoring force. Gravity modes you see in the B-type stars, whereas pressure modes you see both in the O and B-type stars. An important difference between the two is that the gravity modes have the highest probing power near the core of the star, whereas pressure modes predominantly probe the envelope. Now for these oscillations, we group them according to the number of nodes that they have and classify them as such. So if you see here on the left, I'm showing you the differences between what the oscillations look like as we go from one to 3D. In the simple case of a 1D oscillation, that corresponds to a guitar string. So you pluck it and you expect to see that at certain positions on the string, the string does not move. And these positions are what we refer to as nodes. Similar in 2D, such oscillations correspond to the oscillations you see on the surface of a drum, whereas in 3D, you get a sphere. And in this case, you have the blue regions that are moving outwards, and the red regions are moving inwards. And these white lines correspond to the nodes that we have. So in 3D, we have a total of three quantum numbers three numbers that we use to classify the nodes, the frequencies of the stars. We have two kinds of surface nodes, where you have 
the degree L that counts the total number of surface nodes, and you have the azimuthal order that counts the number of surface nodes that crosses the equator. Furthermore, the stars also have nodes inside of them at concentric shells, and these nodes we call the radial order instead. Okay, so these oscillations we see as variations in brightness as a function of time. And these kind of curves we refer to as light curves. By transforming light curves into Fourier spectra that shows you the frequency, the amplitude as a function of frequency, we can identify the pulsation modes of the star. Now, an important thing is for when doing astroseismology and studying stellar pulsation is to observe the stars for as long as possible. And that's illustrated here on the right. So basically, if we take our light curve here and continue to observe the same star for twice as long, what you end up getting is much more resolved frequencies than you had before. And in the same line, you more easily detect frequencies as well as see them to a higher precision. So the best kind of data we have available right now comes from the Kepler nominal Kepler mission, which pointed towards the same field of the sky for four years. So basically, using data from this base telescopes, we have light curves of four years of length available that we can use for astroseismology. Now, one limitation with Kepler is exactly the choice of the field of view, which means that actually no O-type stars were observed by the nominal Kepler mission in any of the fields that you see here. And instead, the higher mass stars that we catch are the B-type stars. So for the B-type stars, the ones that Kepler actually observed fall in the group of the slowly pulsating B-type stars. So in this point in the diagram. So for the rest of this talk, these stars are our heroes, the Jedi Knights of our studies, basically, <laughs> that allows us to try and probe the interior properties of the stars. The stars pulsating gravity modes, which again is important because it allows us to try and probe the convective boundary mixing region inside the star. Furthermore, one property of the gravity modes is that the is that they consist that they form period spacing patterns, so to speak. So basically what that means is you have this same kind of pulsations that have the same kind of, the same number of surface nodes, same number of surface nodes crossing the equator, but the only difference is their radial orders and they're consecutive in these radial orders. If you calculate the period differences between these radial orders, you expect them to have approximately the same value. And if you plot these as a function of the period of, of the pulsations, you get these period spacing patterns that you see here. If you increase the number of surface nodes, this average value of the period spacing pattern decreases as well. Furthermore, we know that from studying period spacing patterns, that when you increase the rotation of the star, what happens is that you introduce a tilt in these patterns. And by simultaneously fitting this, and by fitting this tilt, you simultaneously obtain both the rotational frequency of the star, as well as the average period spacing value you expect to have, and you get a mode identification in the end, which is needed if you want to do astroseismic modeling. Now, if you have a look at how these period spacing patterns change as the star evolves, I'm showing you again here on the left, the hydrogen mass fraction profiles as we go from the center to about 35% of the star. Again, we have the 08 main sequence, middle of the main sequence, and at the end. And correspondingly here on the right, I'm showing you what the period spacing pattern looks like at these three stages of evolution of the star. So basically what happens is as the star evolves, this chemical gradient gets developed and you start getting dips in your period spacing patterns. Furthermore, the average value starts to decrease. And so what mixing does is to go in and change the shape of this chemical gradient and therefore directly impacts also the patterns that you have. To have a look at how exactly they change, 
you see a diagram here where you have again the mixing diagram on the left. On the two panels on the right, I'm showing you the period spacing patterns in the case where we vary the size of the convective boundary mixing region. And on the bottom, incre increasing the amount of envelope mixing. So again, in the white, you have what the pattern looks like in the absence of convective boundary mixing. As we increase the size, we go towards the darker blue curves. And what you see here is that the pattern starts shifting towards the left and that this shift is larger at higher periods than it is at lower periods. And also the pattern starts to generally become shallower as well. When we look at the envelope mixing and start increasing it, moving it upwards in this mixing diagram, you go again from having the white curves, the white patterns, towards having the darker green. In this case, what you see happens is that the patterns become shallower. So basically what we do with astro-seismic modeling is that we compute a large grid of models from which we know what these patterns look like. And then we compare them to observed period spacing patterns to try and constrain the interior properties of the stars. Now to actually do this kind of astro-seismic modeling, we need a group of periods slowly pulsating B-type stars that actually have these period spacing patterns. So let's go back and have a look at the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So here I'm showing you in the colored region, the instability strip of the SPB stars, which is basically showing you that with the brighter regions, you expect to see a higher number of pulsations than in the darker regions of this diagram. Now, as of right now, there are a total of 12 known SVB stars observed by Kepler, where we know that they have period spacing patterns. Out of these 12, only three have actually been modeled in detail, and only two of them were modeled in the attempt to constrain the internal mixing profile. The results from the modeling of these two stars showed that an exponentially decaying convective boundary mixing profile match the observation better than having this step function in the convective boundary mixing region. Furthermore, what was found was that additional mixing in the envelope is needed in order to explain the patterns. So the goal of, and what I've been doing for my PhD is basically to take both these 12 SVB stars and do an ensemble astro-seismic modeling of the entire group but also attempt to fill out this instability strip more such that we end up having an ensemble of stars with different masses, ages, metallicity, and rotations, which we need to actually be able to calibrate our stellar structure and evolution theory. So that is to calibrate our um, interior mixing profiles. So from here on, um, focusing only on the work that I've been doing for my PhD. And first of all, the first step has been to identify new potential SPB stars with period spacing patterns. But in order to do so, I revisited 60 SPB star candidates observed by the Kepler space mission. I started from the pixel data, these images taken of the stars, converted these to light curves from which they were transformed to Fourier spectra, identified all the independent frequencies in these spectra and looked for period spacing patterns. So for this star in particular, what we find is two different ways of, of constructing a period spacing pattern. In the end, out of these 60 candidates, I've identified 26 new SPB stars with period spacing patterns. What I also found for these stars is that you look at the residual light curve that you obtain after excluding or extracting all the coherent signals in the Fourier spectrum, is that quite a large number of the stars show a power excess at lower frequencies. Now this kind of power excess, we expect to see both in the case of internal gravity waves or it can be generated from strong stellar winds, 
or from subsurface convection zones inside the stars. Now for the B-type stars, those are not, do not have strong stellar winds. And also from predictions, the subsurface convection zones reach an absolute minimum from the kind of flux that they generate at the mass range of the SPB stars. So what we find is that the internal gravity waves are the most likely explanation for this low frequency power excess that we find. And 75% of the total sample of SPB stars that I'm studying show strong or weak signatures of this low frequency power excess. Now that we have our additional stars, I've moved on to place them again in the instability strip. So what you see now is a much better coverage of the instability strip, much better coverage in mass as well as ages of the stars. And from here on, we can go on to actually starting to model the stars. These are 20, 34 stars in total from which we could derive the luminosities. And also I can advertise that tomorrow this paper will be available on archive. So the next step, now we have our group of stars that we want to study and model, is to actually start the astroseismic modeling. And to do so, we first need to compute stellar models. Now stellar models are a function of fixed input physics and some varied parameters that we choose. So to give an example, the fixed input physics would be the shape and choice of our interior mixing profile, and the varied parameters would be the mass, metallicity, age, and the chemical, the mixing parameters that we have. So these stellar models are calculated using the stellar structure and illusion code MESA. And from these models, I've used the code Gyre to actually compute their theoretical pulsation properties. And in this, I've also included the rotational frequency as a varied parameter for the modeling. Now, if you look at the considered mixing profiles, I consider in total two different shapes and constructions of the convective boundary mixing and four different versions of the envelope mixing profile. For the convective boundary mixing, one of the profiles I'm considering is the mixing from exponential diffusive overshooting, in which case, as I'm showing you here on the bottom panel, the temperature gradients inside of the star, where you have in gray, just showing you where the convective core is at. The blue lines is correspond to the radiative temperature gradient. The green is the adiabatic. And the red line is the actual temperature gradient applied in the model. So in the case of exponential overshooting, you have a radiative temperature gradient. But for the convective penetration, you have a con constant level of mixing in the convective boundary mixing region. And you also have an adiabatic temperature gradient inside of this region. Now in total, considering these profiles, I computed grids of stellar models for a total of six different co combinations of the profiles. So four combinations for the exponential overshooting and two combinations for the convective penetration. Now from here on, there's one important step and difference uh, from the previous astroseismic modeling efforts and what I'm trying to do. So I have a group of stars and a sample of stars that we need to do modeling for. Previous works has focused on doing this kind of modeling for a single star at a time. And these works also have focused on using a linear sampling of our parameters. What basically that means is still illustrated here on the right, where we vary the initial mass of the star, initial metallicity, and you have this equal step between the different values in the masses, as well as in the metallicity. For each one of these points, you will also have a variation in the mixing parameters. And what this means is that if you end up wanting to refine this grid and add more points, you end up very quickly with a large number of models that you need. For this star in particular, a total of 4.3 million models were computed over several weeks using supercomputer computation time. And if you want to do this for an ensemble of stars, then this is going to be much more difficult and complicated, and it's not feasible in general. 
So basically what I've done is to construct a new modeling framework to be able to handle this ensemble astroseismic modeling that we're doing. So basically, instead of doing a linear sampling of the grid, I've swapped to doing a quasi-random sampling, which allows us to much better sample the grid without having to need the same amount of grid points in total to capture the variations. From this, these quasi-random sample grids, I calculate statistical models that we can use to represent the grid and add additional grid points without having to go back and using supercomputer computation time. Using these statistical models, I'm also able to, instead of assuming the step size in the grid as the errors on my estimated parameters, I can estimate the errors on our masses, for example, using directly the statistical models. And finally, instead of relying on a chi-square evaluation to obtain our best model, I'm swapping to using Mahalanobis distances. So if you go and have a look at the statistical models, they're rep represented using this equation, where you have y would be your observable, for example, the frequency you're trying to estimate. You have x are the components of theta, your varied parameters. So that would be mass, metallicity, mixing parameters, the age and rotation rate of the star. And finally, beta are your regression coefficients. Now, using different combinations of these varied parameters, we construct statistical models that predict, we construct these statistical models based on the original grids or stellar models that we computed. And from this, we can predict what the frequencies, for example, would be at different values of these theta components that are not originally covered in the grid. Furthermore, by relying on these regression coefficients, we can estimate the errors on our estimated parameters by simply going in, looking at our coefficients and perturbing them according to their uncertainties, recalculate what the frequency would be, and from this, redetermine what our best theta estimate is for a given star. We repeat this a hundred times, and in the end, you end up with a distribution in, for example, mass, that we can then use to estimate the errors on our estimated parameters. Now, finally, instead of using a chi-square evaluation, we use Mahalanobis distances. So just very quickly, this formula shows you your observables y, which are for example, your effective temperature, luminosity, or your frequencies. Why theo is the theoretical counterpart of this. And the sigma over here corresponds to the errors on your obser observations. Now in the simple case where you have two observables, again, for example, luminosity and effective temperature, or two frequencies, if you have no covariance amongst these two observables, you expect to see the distribution you see here on the left. So each one of these gray points corresponds to a point in the grid. If we have an observation here in white and measure the distance from this observation to two points A and B, what we expect is to have the same distance, approximately the same distance between these points and our observation. However, in the case where we actually have covariance between our observables, the distribution changes. And in reality, if you look at how many standard deviations that these two points are from the observation, then the point B will be much closer to your observed value than the point A. So what you do with the Mahalanobis distance is to take into account these kind of covariance structures in the best predictions of your parameters in the end. So we've done this, include the Mahalanobis distance in the estimating of our parameters. And basically the smallest distance provides you the best point estimation of your variables that we have. Now for the final model setup goes as follows. So you have once again on the right, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram 
where I show you in the back the total grid from one of our one of my chosen mixing profiles. You have example, illusionary tracks in white. And on top of this plot, we put in one of the stars to be modeled. Using the observed effective temperatures, surface gravities, luminosity, and metallicity, we use these parameters to estimate the ranges in thetas that should be considered. Using our statistical models, we then refine the grid within, within these error boxes such that we end up with a total of 100,000 grid points to be used from the astro seismic modeling. From these grid points, we calculate what the critical rotation rate of a given model would be, use the observed rotational frequency combined with the estimated critical rotation to derive the rotational frequency rates to use for the to, in order to calculate, finally, the frequencies from our statistical models. Doing so, we calculate, match the frequencies, and finally use the Mahalanobis distance to estimate our parameters theta, and also calculate the errors estimated from these calculations. So here on the next slide, I'm showing you some of the results that I've obtained from doing these modeling efforts. Here, each one of the points in each of these plots corresponds to a different star. On the left, you see the radial size of the convective core and mass of the convective core as a function of the age of the star, represented as the total or the fraction of core hydrogen content to the total initial hydrogen mass fraction of the star. So from the zero eight main sequence, this ratio would be one. And as the star evolves, we move towards the right in this diagram. So basically what we're seeing is that as the star evolves, the radial sizes of the cores decreases independently of, yeah, independently of what their rotational frequency is. Whereas if you look at the total mass of the convective core, then it's, the trend is not as easy to see, and there's more of a scatter in this case. In the center, you see once again the radial size of the convective core, the mass of the convective core, but this time as a function of the amount of envelope mixing that we have. And here the points are color-coded according to the age, such that younger stars are white and older stars are black in this diagram. So for the radial size of the core, we see more of a scatter and no clear trends between the two. Whereas when we go to the mass, total mass of the convective core, what we see is a tendency for the mass of the core to increase as the amount of envelope mixing increases as well. On the top right panel, you see the extent of the convective boundary mixing region as a function of the mass of the star. And what we see here is a lack of stars in this lower right corner of the diagram, indicating that for higher mass stars, you don't get a um, lower envelope with the lower convective boundary mixing regions. Now, this might just be an observational effect since we have only two stars at this higher mass region. So whether this is a real trend or not is something to be clarified later on. Finally, on the bottom right panel, I'm showing you the radial size of the core as a function of the mass of the convective core. And what we see here is that, as what we would expect, when the radial size of the core is large, so is also the mass of the core. Okay. So what we really wanted to find and look at uh, was what kind of interior mixing profile is the one that best describes real stars. So for the, this slide, I'm showing you uh, what kind of mixing profile is preferred amongst the stars. So here's a histogram where I'm taking, um, for each star, the, I'm counting which one of the three, which one of the six profile is preferred over the other one. 
and then adding them in this histogram. So basically, the first point here says that none of the stars prefers uh, the mixing profile where you have exponential overshooting combined with a constant envelope mixing. What we find, and what I find here, is that about 83% of the stars prefers the profiles where you have exponential diffusive overshooting. And 90%, about 90% of the stars prefers some kind of structure in the envelope mixing profiles, whether this comes from the internal gravity waves or from shear instabilities. So the takeaway messages from these studies is that I've looked at the largest sample and identified the largest sample of Kepler SPB stars with the detected period spacing patterns. I found that 75% of these stars show signatures of internal gravity waves. I've developed a new modeling framework to be used for the ensemble astroseismic modeling of the stars and apply this to model the period spacing patterns in combination with the spectroscopic information and the Gaia luminosities. And from these studies, I found that some structure in the envelope mixing profile is strongly preferred for these stars. Now, Kepler is an amazing telescope and instrument. I like it very much. One issue with it is again that it didn't observe the really high mass stars. So right now, TESS is remedying this, this situation by providing one year light curves of about 340 O and P type stars. So here I'm showing you again a hertzsprung russell diagram, basically, where you have in the black all stars observed in the first two sectors of this test space mission. And the color regions correspond to the O and B type stars where we detected variability. And so this is part of future work to move towards the higher mass stars, which I hope to be able to do in September as well when I move to Santa Barbara and continue working on these highly interesting stars. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening in for my defense. And that's it for now. Thank you, May. Thank you very much. Um, so it's now, to, it's now time to open uh, the floor for uh, the discussion. I first would like to uh, remind the public, which is following us on uh, YouTube, I can see, um, what the procedure is. Uh, May has already defended her thesis in a private session with all the members of the jury present. And now I'm going to introduce the jury. So we have, uh, uh, we have uh, the supervisor, let's start with the supervisor, uh, Connie Arts from the Institute of Astronomy of uh, the KU Leuven. Oops, that was not Connie. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, the uh, co-supervisor, Peter Papic, from, uh, also from the Institute of Astronomy of the KU Leuven. Hello, Peter. And then we have uh, the external member of the jury. We have um, Jürgen Christian Dalsgaard from uh, Aarhus University in Denmark. Hello. We have uh, Professor Tamara Rogers, from uh, Newcastle University in the United Kingdom. Hello, Tamara. We have uh, uh, Professor John uh, Sundquist uh, from the Institute of Astronomy of KU Leuven. And then uh, um, we have, uh, it's excused, uh, Professor uh, Hans Walter Rix uh, from uh, the uh, Max Planck Institute uh, for Astronomy in Heidelberg. But he was present uh, in the first session. He also um, ask the relevant question to, uh, to me. And my name, myself, I am uh, Ricardo Rabe from the Institute of uh, Nuclear Radiation Phys Physics of the University of Leuven. So I will now open the floor for questions and I remind, remind the public that uh, um, they can also ask questions afterwards. Um, well, or, or during, uh, you can do that on the chat and uh, Peter, Peter will then relay the question to us. Um, so let's start with the questions, and I give the word to uh, uh, Professor Jorge, uh, Jorgen Christen Talsgaard. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be virtually present for this defense. And, and 
very impressed by by the work that you've been do, doing. My uh, <laughs> your the presentation was, was extremely clear and, and covered a very broad range. It's good to see that you listened when I gave lectures on still evolution. You got that more or less right. <laughs> And uh, your presentation of your work was also very clear. And, and in particular, I have been impressed by your thesis. The range of topics that you've been addressing in, in this project is absolutely amazing. It's sort of a lifetime's work packed in, into four years covering data analysis and spectroscopy and stellar modeling and fitting data and, and, and all that, everything. It's there in, in, in this thesis, and the results are very interesting. And that, of course, is what we have to discuss more. We could go on for a very long time. I try, try to keep this fairly brief. But uh, before going on to the questions, may I I'll allow myself to say a few words in Danish also, since that's a secret language that we share <laughs> and, and share with some of the audience. So, so my du selvfølgelig en af vores egne. Du lavede din uh, kandidatgrad i, i Aarhus. Vi havde meget glæde af, af både din deltagelse i kurser og, det, og dit projektarbejde med Vicky og Tocci om noget helt andet, flere af, af stjerner. Og det har været fantastisk at se dig komme til løven og virkelig vokse i Connys gruppe. Arbejdet med mange forskellige ting. Inklusive observationer med Mercator-teleskopet, det står der forhåbentlig endnu. Jeg har ikke hørt, at der skulle være sket noget uheldigt med det, i hvert fald, mens du har observeret dernede. Og så er resultatet blevet det her, den her fantastiske afhandling, som du kan være meget, meget stolt af. Det kan din familie også. Og så er du så heldig, at du skal videre til Santa Barbara. Det er et af mine yndlingssteder, både hvad angår den videnskabelige miljø, og som et sted at være, et sted at bo. Så det bliver herligt, og jeg håber meget, at din familie får lejlighed til at besøge dig der, når verden bliver lidt mere åben, end den er nu. Og jeg håber også selv at møde dig i Santa Barbara. Der kommer et, et møde i Santa Barbara om et år eller to, hvor jeg håber at deltage. Så det ser jeg meget frem til. Og inden der håber jeg meget, at vi kan mødes og fejre din forhåbentlig succes med det her forslag. Jeg er færdig nu. Så so, uh, with that, let me move on and, and start... Uh, with a few questions. Maybe, first of all, uh, the broadest question at all, what, what, what do you see the significance of, of your results in, in a broader sense of astrophysics? Where, where do you see the impact of, of what you've been uh, doing in other areas of astrophysics? Oh, in other areas. <laughs> Connie's microphone is very loud. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's that's a very good question. So I think uh, one aspect is, so again, the entire idea is to try to calibrate stellar structure and evolution models. Um, so for example, with the results that I have here, there's uh, differences between also how uh, people in general do stellar evolution models. So one of the results from my thesis is that none of the standard shapes of the interior mixing profiles that what you generally see in those some of these stellar structure and evolution codes are actually the ones that seem to represent what's happening inside of stars, at least from the results that I have right now. So one impact would be that maybe what we need to do is shift towards using other mixing profiles as a standard compared to what is being done right now. That, 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 of course, is very important. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and where do you see that impact in, in the way that people are used to doing stellar modeling mm -hmm. and, and using stellar modeling for other aspects of astrophysics? Yeah. Well, uh, do, do, uh, is there any particular case where, uh, where this might be important? Particular cases where this might be important? Well, for the interior mixing, in, in general, so it's important if you want to obtain, again, accurate masses of the stars, also when doing binary modeling. So you can use binaries as well to try and constrain some of the interior mm -hmm. mixing properties. We also know from studying stars in 
clusters. Uh, we know that some of these younger clusters show as spreads in the um, main sequence turnoff points where we expect the stars to start to evolve away from the main sequence. And this kind of spreads, one of the explanations from it for it is the rotational mixing occurring inside of the stars. But for some of these clusters, we see that actually rotation does not seem to be the full explanation, or at least there's not a clear correlation between the measured surface rotation rates and the positions of the stars in these um, Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams. In other cases, there seems to be a correlation. So it's once again um, to try and encourage also the community to look at different kinds of profiles that might as well help and explain the interior mixing properties of the stars. So that would be one of possible future works is also to try and look into these um, ex clusters with extended main sequence turnoffs and also utilizing the pulsating stars in these clusters to try and constrain and figure out what which one of the mixing profiles maybe best explains this extended main sequence turnoff that we see. Excellent. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of work to do with, with all that. So it's definitely. <laughs> you won't be spending all the time on the beach in, in Santa Barbara. No, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> so uh, let, let's move on to something a, a little bit more detailed. And one, one thing I was impressed about was your uh, determination of luminosity and effective temperature of the stars and, and the placing the stars in the HR diagram, which of course is also an important part of, of constraining the properties of the stars and thereby con constraining the, uh, the mixing processes. So what do you think is going to be required to improve the determination of the both the effective temperature and the luminosity beyond what you've been doing here? Both the effect of temperature and luminosity. Hmm. <laughs> well, so for some of the stars, the effect of temperatures uh, comes from spectroscopy. And in other cases, they come from uh, using colors, for example. Um, yeah, for, for all the stars in this case, I managed to find spectroscopic information for all the stars. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, the spectra are of, I know, low resolution, so that they might not be the best estimates of the temperatures mm -hmm. actually that we have. So one step would be to go back for these stars and try to obtain new spectra and get better estimates of the affected temperatures. For the luminosities based from that, from that or moving onwards. So one thing is also, I know that we will have uh, a new Gaia data release coming up, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. once again, the distances estimates to these stars will be improved again. So that's one direct way in the near future that you can start to get better, even better estimates of the luminosities as well. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, then if I may become even more technical, uh, I, I would love to dis discuss uh, Mahalanobis uh, analysis. <laughs> In detail with you. That's really one of the main things I've learned from, from this, this work, but maybe now is not the time. But uh, in, the, in your analysis of the frequency spectra uh, to determine the, the period spacings and the uh, rotation, it's not really clear from the thesis how you derive the errors on those quantities. So the errors on... The errors on the frequency, on the period spacings, the errors on the rotation rates. Uh, so how, how, how do you do that? <laughs> okay. You quote, you quote them, so they must come from somewhere. Yes. <laughs> um, right. So for the errors on the rotation rates, um, so those are obtained from basically fitting these period spacing patterns um, that we mm -hmm. have. So we know that if we increase the rotation, that you get this tilt mm -hmm. in the pattern. Um, so one reason why you end up getting larger errors on these measured rotation rates is that the methodology that we use actually assumes that you don't have any of these dips in the period spacing patterns, mm. which is not really the case in reality. So just from the fact that you have dips and non-uniform structures, you end up with more of a valley of solutions that defines what the error ranges of your 
um, rotation rates are, for example, as well as the average level of the period spacing patterns. Right, and, and of course that also affects the error in, in period spacing. Yes. Similarly. So how would you improve on that? How would you improve? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> That's um, why I ask it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. Well, I get, well, in a sense, you kind of already do when you do the modeling. So already when you do the matching of the models from the periods spacing patterns, those matches that you do are with patterns where you do have these dips mm. in the period spacing series. So in this case, uh, you also reevaluate a bit the rotation rate of the star by doing this astro seismic modeling. So these from fitting the these uh, period spacing patterns and their slopes, that's a first estimate of the rotation rate of the star. And from then onwards, you can also try and rely on other different stellar models to actually maybe get a better estimate of the rotation rate. So okay. I think that's the way I would do it. <laughs> there might okay. be better options, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I have many more questions, but I'll save those for later when we meet. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I now give the word to uh, Professor Rogers. I don't have any further questions. For, <laughs> no. Okay. Well, hi, Tammy. <laughs> yeah, hi. It was very Thank good, you. very amazing, impressive thesis with a lot of work in it. And I look forward to what you're going to do in the future. Um, and I want to hear what you're going to be doing in Santa Barbara, but that's for offline. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so the word to uh, Professor Sundquist then. Um, Leuven somewhere. Yes. Hi, Mike. Uh, Hi. <laughs> again, congratulations to, to your thesis and a very nice piece of work. Uh, also, the presentation of them uh, today. I agree with the, the the former speakers that it was uh, it was very clear and well structured. So, uh, good work again. Um, I thought I will ask one or two uh, small questions. Um, on this and uh, the first is also connected to, to a little bit to, to, to the last questions about these uh, Mahalla Nawabis distances that I can never pronounce. Um, so this is basically that you have devised uh, a new way of, of, of doing of finding your best fit model and of course there are also uh, a lot of other uh, uh, applications where you can in astrophysics where you can benefit from, from this approach. And we take one which is near your field, very near because you use it and also we use it here, uh, when you do stellar spectroscopy, for example, particularly these massive stars that you're gonna work about with. Typically, if you do standard spectroscopy, you're gonna deal with something like eight, nine parameters and they will be highly correlated. So how would you go about to perhaps adopt your procedure that you have now developed uh, to do astroseismology, to also perform well in spectroscopic fitting of stars. Uh, is it possible? And what would you think about what would be the advantages, disadvantages? Yeah, so it should be possible. And I think it might actually be done already by other people, <laughs> without me being entirely sure. Um, so I guess one thing you have to define first is the again, the observables you want to put in and the parameters that you want to estimate in the end. Um, I don't think it makes sense, or I don't know if it would, to just take the entire spectrum and match it to a theoretical estimate of a spectrum. Maybe you can, but otherwise uh, use yeah, some of the parameters from the spectrum that you get and compare those to mm -hmm. the predictions. Mm -hmm. um, and how would we work out, for example, let's say we have 
Yeah, we want to derive things like temperatures, gravities, chemical surface abundances from the spectra. How would we uh, go about to work out these correlations? Because I guess you have to work them out in order to yes. use <laughs> Mahala over yes. distance, right? Yes, that is true. Um, well, you do know that correlations exist between mm -hmm. parameters. Um, exactly how you would do the setup from for spectra, <laughs> I guess I would have to think a bit more on. I, I'm not entirely sure up front what the best strategy would be. So I'm a bit hesitant to make any big con <laughs> conclusions yeah. on it. Uh, but yeah, I'm pretty sure I've seen uh, the Mahalanobis distance before being applied to obtain both spectral classification and estimates of the affected temperatures and other stellar parameters. So I guess, again, you'd have to start from a grid of spectra, and it's it's still a matching of those to the observations. How exactly that's done with the Mahalanobis distance, I'd have to think on a bit more, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I understand. OK, uh, thanks. And then I had a second uh, small question also, and that was, uh, I saw from your talk today that you do say that the envelope mixing in quite a lot of your analyzed stars, um, uh, yeah, you get preferred models with envelope mixing, but I saw that you sort of hinted, you didn't say it's explicitly, that you may be able to distinguish between rotational induced mixing, uh, the shear mixing, and your wave induced mixing. Um, yes. Is that true? Can you distinguish between these two cases? And so how? Yeah, so again, so the results that I've shown so far is just that mm -hmm. you need some structure in the envelope of the star to mm -hmm. explain the observations. Um, I think the next step to really try and distinguish between the two of them would go a, would be to start to have a, a look at clusters where we know, uh, where we have additional information also from the positions of the stars in these clusters and knowing that they need to match also with the isochrones that we have mm -hmm. um, estimated from those. So I think that future steps would be um, to both go on and look at clusters, but also one thing I haven't utilized yet is the actual measured surface abundances of these stars. So we do have measurements of uh, the nitrogen abundance for some of these stars. And depending on which profile you have, they will predict more or less uh, excess of surface nitrogen mm -hmm. abundance. So I think it's it could be possible as soon as we start taking these abundance measurements into account, it might help us unravel which one of the two also does a better job in that sense. So for that, I think we need more information than just the pulsations that we have. Okay. And then just a final, very small, when you move on uh, to this uh, higher mass star na stars mm -hmm. now, do you see any additional complications? For example, in uh, another interesting result that you have from your thesis um, is this uh, low frequency excess. Do you expect that also for high massive stars or are there other mechanisms that might be problematic there? Because that's the next step in that you're gonna analyze, right? Well, uh, I won't be focusing so much on the low frequency power excess. So I know there are people mm -hmm. already working on that. Mm -hmm. And we, there are papers out and available already showing that also as you go to higher mass stars, you detect these low frequency power excess. So this is something we know uh, is there already. And we also have 3D simulations showing what you expect the spectra to look like from internal gravity waves. So right now the comparisons are being done by what kind of spectra you expect to get from the low frequency gravity waves, as mm -hmm. well as, yeah, I guess, from winds and the subsurface convection zones to try and distinguish okay. which one of the mechanisms are more likely. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations <laughs> again. <laughs> Very Thank nice. you. And good luck, good luck in uh, Lucatel in uh, Santa Barbara. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from uh, the uh, supervisors? Uh, Peter? Thank you. 
Uh, my congratulations with your defense. Your presentation was good, as always your presentations are, and your results are also very, very nice. Uh, maybe I have one general question, if you want another question, because we've already <laughs> asked you several uh, in the public and in the private defense too. Uh, and maybe my question, since you've been made, maybe continuing a bit with the research I've been doing before I left, is what's the future now for SPB Star? So where do we go on from now? From now on? <laughs> well, I still think, so again, I'm so confused. <laughs> uh, again, so right now I have one group of SPB stars observed by Kepler. It's compared to what we had before, it's a large sample of SPB stars to model. Um, I still think by further enlarging this sample and also start picking out stars from different metallicity environments than the ones covered already, I think we can learn also more on how these profiles change as we as the metallicity of the stars change and see if there's any dependence on this as well. So I think that's one thing. Um, the current sample, there's still a lot of things to be exploited as well. So right now I've only modeled one of the patterns that I've detected in the stars. Some of them show multiple. And by utilizing these additional patterns, we should be also be able to get much better constraints on the interior properties of the stars. So I think that's some next steps <laughs> to do. And I definitely think there's still a lot of things that can be done for these SPB stars. Still a very much hot field. <laughs> Thank you, Mai. Thank you, Peter. Um, Professor Arts, Connie, do you have any uh, other questions? I am never out of questions, <laughs> but uh, I'll skip them for today. <laughs> obviously, my sound is not good. Well, my microphone is weak now, your mic was muted. Do I have to do something? No, you are okay, but your mic was muted before. Okay. So I'll repeat and I'll just skip the questions and uh, hold uh, another new nice discussion with my as we had so many once uh, she has been able to catch up, sleep and relax. <laughs> okay. So, thanks. Excellent. So um, it's my turn. Um, so first of all, uh, still the microphone's open, I think. Yeah. So first of all, my congratulations for uh, your uh, impressive work and especially today for uh, the defense. It was uh, very nice, uh, very uh, visual. Uh, I don't even want to ask how much time you spent on, uh, <laughs> on making these animations or uh, uh, all the, the, the slides, uh, very nice. Um, I want to ask you just a very general questions uh, of, uh, because uh, not uh, especially the, 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 the public do not know, uh, or they never ask this kind of questions. Here you write in the beginning of your thesis that um, the um, the uh, the stars are bit the chemical fact factories of the universe. But uh, which elements, up to which elements do you come in the stars actually? Which element can you produce there? <laughs> well, in the nuclear burning in the core, what's being generated that is up to iron for the most highest mass stars. So that's just from the nuclear burning. And from then on, you need, it's later on in the, I guess, the supernova explosion interactions that you get the more higher elements than that. For the nuclear burning itself, it's it's up to iron that can. So they're and starting we, up with an iron core. And do you know which processes uh, lead to a uh, heavier element? We <laughs> uh, <laughs> call this nuclear astrophysics you know <laughs> yeah yeah um that's why i guess both s and r processes <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. yeah that are happening in these supernova explosions that lead to the production of the heavy elements again yeah the uh well uh, the, the one of the uh, um highlights of uh, the the last few months in fact last few years it's been this uh, neutron merger um discovery, well, observation, let's say observation. Mm -hmm. 
where we had confirmation that actually this is one of the sites where this can happen, in fact. Um, I don't know if there are questions from the public. I see that there is some delay, but uh, um, I will ask Peter if uh, he has picked up something. Uh, yes, so far there is only one question. I will pull that in so we will all see that uh, as better. And in the meantime, there are questions from the, uh, from the public, then please comment on YouTube and then we will try to pick one or two for mine before letting her know. So, what, what I didn't understand. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, so yeah, uh, um, it's true when we do the actual stellar model computations, we exclude the rotation in the MESA models themselves. And so the reason for that is one, that a, you have a lot of free parameters to adjust when including rotation in MESA. So one reason is to, in order to limit the number of free parameters that we use in the modeling. Another is also that we've seen that the mixing profiles that you generate by activating rotation as MESA can be quite um, spiky, so to speak. And when you have these non-flat but suddenly spiky profiles that comes and go away, then these can have quite a large impact on the gravity mode computations that you have later on. So they having smooth, well-behaved profiles is very important when you want to study uh, pulsations. When using them directly just, just to study stellar evolution, it's it works perfectly fine. You can use MESA models for this. It's more complicated when we go and use them for the pulsation calculations. So that's basically the reason why we switch off rotation in MESA. But instead, what we do is then take um, envelope mixing profiles that you expect to get from rotation instead, and then just scale them up or down according to this one parameter. That's the log dx that I've been using in the presentation and in my thesis. So in that way, you end up with the same one parameter that you use for all of the mixing profiles that you adjust. So that's an easier way to circumvent any issues you might end up getting by switching on rotation in MESA. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope that answered the question. Um, there are no other questions, I think. Um, Peter, you confirm that? Yes, I can confirm that there are no other questions. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, if that's the case, the jury will uh, retire for uh, to deliberate and uh, come back in a few minutes. And the audience can stay, so this live stream will continue. And when we are done with the deliberation, we will rejoin this. So if you want, you can also question, ask questions from my now to the YouTube comments, and she can answer that while the jury is done, so we cannot hear what she says. I think I have to get kicked out of the room. Oh, yes, sorry. You cannot ask any more questions. <laughs> Send me a message on Facebook or an email or something. <laughs> yeah.
I think we are back online. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if uh, the 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 rest of the jury is uh, in the room or is uh, the backstage. They are there. They are there. They are there. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I will now proclaim the result of the deliberation by the examination committee appointed for a doctoral degree in science, astronomy, and astrophysics. Miss uh, Maiga de Pedersen has presented to the faculty her PhD thesis on the topic, interior rotation, mixing, and ages of a sample of slowly pulsating B stars from gravity mode asteroseismology, in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the PhD in science, astronomy, and astrophysics. And she has defended her thesis in a public session before the examination committee. The examination committee has determined that all requirements concerning the granting of the doctoral degree that are prescribed by the law and by the university regulations have been met. Therefore, on behalf of the rector of the Kaulöwen, I confer upon Ms. Maiga de Pedersen the, doc the degree of Doctor in Science, Astronomy and Astrophysics, and thereby close the session. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations, uh, Maya. Thank you um, very much. <laughs> yeah, very good job. I now give the word to the promoter, uh, Connie, ah, Professor Connie. Hi, can you hear me? Dr. Mai. <laughs> <laughs> My sincere congratulations to this uh, fabulous achievement. And I welcome you to the world of the doctors in science. Um, it's a very special day today, and I'm sure you will agree with me that it's different than we both had imagined it, uh, <laughs> in some sense. Corona screwed up our original plans, but we will be hitting back, as we always tend to do. And uh, one of the things we did when we knew that your original date was not possible, was to pick another special day. And so today, for those online who are not aware, today is exactly four years after my graduated as a master at Orbis University on 4 uh, May 2016, right? Under the supervision of Vicky and Tochi. She was already mentioned by Jordan, but I also insist on uh, recalling that because I am sure that you will agree with me that Vicky played a very important role in today's success and so i'm grateful to her and i want her to see it also as her success today i actually do not know what vicky told you when uh, you were about to uh, uh, search for phd positions so somehow she encouraged you to uh, apply for the position here in leuven and I had the impression when you were uh, arriving here that you were a little bit scared of me <laughs> <laughs> somehow. Um, that has changed over the past four years with a steep uh, increase in your level of self-confidence. And we worked on it by the day. But uh, again, let me repeat what I've told you so often in the past four years. For this defense, there is no reason to worry about it. Right. Um, now, as you know, I have uh, over the years, I had many PhD students, right? And it becomes always harder and harder to find some <laughs> original uh, feedback or reflection, let's say, uh, particularly because I like saying, yeah, you were the first in this and the mm -hmm. first in that. And so it's uh, in that sense a bit difficult, you might think. Totally wrong in the case of Mai, because she is a primer on many fronts. So I will name a few now, right? Mai is my first Danish PhD student. <laughs> and this will hit me really badly in a few minutes. <laughs> uh, Mai is also uh, my first PhD student doing an online public defense. That's an easy one, right? Um, but Mai is also 
my very first PhD students who ever had the courage to reorganize my Mamsie tea meetings. <laughs> Nobody else has ever done that before. And in her view, these should have been transformed and are now called cake meetings, right? So uh, at the command of my, we are all obliged to supply cake during our meetings. Uh, she was still generous to us in the sense that we're not obliged to call it Danish pastry meetings, <laughs> uh, almost. So we still get to choose the treat that we bring, but that's certainly also a primer. Um, also, you are my very first PhD students. Uh, who allowed me to give your talk. Remember? Mm -hmm. Because Mai was practicing Taekwondo at one point, and she did it so fiercely that her knee protested. And so there she was, not able to travel to the Lawrence Center in Leiden. So I just gave your talk, which was an experience. <laughs> That's also unique. Huh? Um, but what I would also still want to say uh, here is that you are actually my first PhD student and the first one in the world who has dared to consider envelope mixing in modeling SPB stars. And this is, of course, your pet topic. And I'm very grateful to Tammy, who is listening in, because it's also thanks to her that we had the courage to uh, have some original coupling between hydrodynamical simulations and uh, stellar modeling. And so I think this is really how uh, you uh, are known in the community. Um, then there is another thing where you are a primer. And I actually don't know if you realize that. And I also don't know if your other supervisor realizes it. You are my first scientific granddaughter. <laughs> She's looking at me like with a front face now, <laughs> but you're also my scientific daughter and I like that a little bit more. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, that brings me to your supervisor, your co-supervisor, uh, Peter, who I would also like to thank uh, in this Laudatio, because I am sure that you will agree with me Mai, that uh, he, is, uh, he was a perfect co-supervisor for you. And the reason might be that Petra and I tend to differ tremendously <laughs> on some aspects. We also have some similarities. So um, we differ a lot. And so that made us complementary and uh, I think uh, a good trio. Where does it differ? Well, Petra is very calm. <laughs> That's useful to have. Um, but he's also a Python expert. That's also very useful to have. And I am absolutely a no on that front. So this is very convenient. Uh, the things we share maybe uh, is that we both have a keen eye to see period spacings in SPBs. Very convenient. Yeah. Um, but he's always available to you. I certainly was not in that category. Still, I tried my best. <laughs> But Peter was literally around the corner for you, and I think that was a tremendous uh, help for you. So I think we are a good trio, and uh, my thanks go to him. And now I am going to do something that is extremely difficult, and that you forced me to do somehow. <laughs> but then a special day is can I also tell to my family, Ogener. Is there he was for Elter? I, uh, oh, uh, Trillingen Boer. That is this very Denmark is the first answer here in Leuven Ide. Yeah, my chakra is for high online for the most special of a kind of for your daughter and sister. We can for you to have my here in Leuven in this this four year. They can expect for family. Thank 
Friends, men from Rwanda stickers of their holding. So else is maar andere en this is still. Es can heel at my estate till maar weer en dan kun kun oorstille reizen die België. Jere still at my en klaar til go a new aventuur en verwachting oor her kro. Let the embargo, for the care go, and when it's clear, it's clear, it's clear. We stand up for our family, and in Denmark, and in England. So, and we can, every day, and every day, invite to visit our love, for her mine in a girl, proud to say, nine feel, and we're coming, Corona, Und andere sind Spessis Urfelinge, für ein Schorde Mödes, für Fähre, Mai, Succe. Und ich komme auch auf, dass ihr das verstanden habt, was ich gesagt habe, aber ich muss jetzt noch recovern und Peter wird das verstanden für ein Weile. Oh! Dear Mai, ich würde auch gerne meine Glückwunsch verabschieden. Und ich wünsche dir, dass du heute mit deinen Freunden und Freunden in Person zelebrieren könntest. Ich denke, dass sie nicht hier sind, das ist der schwierigste Teil deiner ganzen PhD. Still, I'm happy that at least we can be here with you, for you, and I'm sure that the time of broader celebrations will arrive too. I didn't know that the job description for being a co-supervisor would also include driving you to the emergency room with the aforementioned knee incident, but I would have done that as a pure friend too. You never really needed more help than some minor scientific guidance or an extra set of critical eyes. You're very independent. We have the skill set of both of both an observer and a theoretician, so my whole supervision was mostly limited to brainstorming discussions. Discussions where I stopped being the expert very early on, much sooner than you realize. Of course, Connie made your supervision a piece of cake, and yes, that's the pun intended, <laughs> since often by the time I heard her a small problem or challenge, challenge, as she prefers to say, Connie already had a detailed battle plan worked out for us. I think we were both perfectly happy with this setup, so I would like to thank indeed Connie for being as good of a supervisor for you as she was for me seven years earlier. I wish you very good luck in Santa Barbara. I don't need to wish you good weather because that's given. <laughs> and don't forget that you can count on many of us, not only as colleagues, but as friends. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so, to wrap up, uh, your I, have a, I am so glad that people are happy. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Dr. Mai, Peter and I are very proud, as we said. I actually am a little bit jealous because you will continue your scientific career as a postdoctoral researcher at the Calvary Institute of Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara, working under the guidance of Lars Wilson. And that's you again offer me a primer and you do infinitely better than your supervisor who miserably failed to get a postdoc in the US. I tried many times, you tried once and off you go. I am convinced that you are heading for a bright future over there and I certainly look forward to visit you there and to continue our scientific mother-daughter, I prefer the mother <laughs> collaboration. Uh, now, usually at occasions like this, uh, it is perhaps a bit sad, but uh, we would now be handing over you a presence. And above all, we will toast with bubbles to your success to celebrate you as a new doctor. Now, the coronavirus thinks it's uh, screwed up our plans, but um, it completely underestimates our imagination. Um, among the three of us, because I happen to have uh, attended a crash course on how to bring bubbles while social distancing. <laughs> and while those uh, who are uh, now online uh, will have to uh, do their own thing, uh, we will try and practice that uh, later today um, within all our government's regulations. So the good thing is we shall celebrate at least twice once now with bubbles, specialized in social distancing, 
And at another time, I'm sure in a hopefully not too distant future, with real presence, again with lots of bubbles. Hmm? There's always a good reason to celebrate like that. And also with some warm hugs that we can't do right now. So for now, I really want to thank everybody who stayed uh, and supported my during the uh, PhD in an online version. I would sort of like to ask all of you to symbolically unmute and to give our new doctor a fabulous round of ear applause. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I really feel gypped at not being able to have cake with my and chocolate yeah. and uh -huh. all the things that we normally do when we're in love. And I yeah. so very now, sad. now, Ma, you can say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> I can. <laughs> so I didn't uh, prepare really much mm -hmm. of that speech, also because I know personally I get very emotional when mm -hmm. speaking. <laughs> so if I continue for so long, I'm not going to be able to finish. That's just how it is. Um, but I'd like to uh, thank, or maybe start in a different place, and say thanks to Vicky, who I hope is still listening in, uh, and say that she's really the reason why I'm actually doing a PhD at the moment, um, because she believed and encouraged me to pursue a PhD. <laughs> And also thanks to both Connie and Peter for taking me in and guiding me uh, throughout this journey uh, and being both motivated on my part and really enthusiastic about my work and what I was doing and always being ready to help <laughs> when you can, even if it's related to driving me to the hospital, I guess, <laughs> or providing caramel coffees and chocolates and times of writing. <laughs> Even these things that might seem small matters a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm very happy, very relieved by now. Uh, also, want to very quickly thank Anna for helping with figuring out this entire setup, <laughs> and Emily and Julia for helping with practicing, <laughs> and it's several more people from both the IBS and also at home for being very encouraging and also following me in on this day. Uh, so thank you all for joining. Unfortunately, uh, I couldn't do the defense in a castle, which I very much hoped to. So every people who know me well knows I really like castles. So not this time around, <laughs> but hopefully we get uh, another opportunity and a different time to actually celebrate today. So I hope maybe you all have available at home some bubbles or different beverages to celebrate. Uh, I'll try to get back to all the comments that people have been texting me. I have way, way too many right now. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining in. And thank you to the jury committee for joining in as, as well and for the comments and feedback. It's all been very helpful and challenging, which is a good thing. <laughs> I'm very excited for any new adventures that I'll be facing in the future. And I hope to see as many of you still as possible and also both at uh, friends for a drink and also for collaboration. So thank you all for joining and being here. If there's anything else I was supposed to say, I forgot. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> so I'm gonna end it here and then hopefully at a different point in time, we're gonna celebrate with some bubbles, everyone together. And I'll get around to each one of you. So thank you for following. <laughs> and yes. Yeah, and thank you for following, and that's it for today. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>